Hi, this is Dr. Goldkamp, and I wanted to do a part one, part two of the history and evolution of, of fasting and the ketogenic diet. So I have this as a Snagit rendition of what I did for the pod, for the podcast. The podcast ended up being about 43 minutes and figured I could make this into two smaller pieces because I think it's pretty important to know the background for fasting and the ketogenic diet. So when we hear about something new, whether it's exogenous ketones or what your ketone levels need to be or what your glucose level needs to be, and I say needs in quotes and air quotes, um, I don't want anybody to be thinking that, oh my gosh, this is such new technical stuff. No, it's not new technical stuff. Actually, it's probably about 100. Uh, the new semi-modern era is at least 150 years old, and ketones didn't get to become therapeutic until the early part of the 1900s. So um, the point here is to make you all feel much more comfortable and knowledgeable with uh, understanding about fasting and ketones and why they are such a big deal, but not to be intimidated either with the terminology or with thinking you need to um, always follow uh, a guru of some sort. So this is to put the information back in your hands because it always is going to come down to you and your numbers and what you want to do with your life relative to this. It's about metabolic health if you want to make a point. Okay, here we go. So it's pretty conspicuous, pretty obvious to me that we stand on the shoulders of giants who have laid down the foundation of all that we know about the ketogenic diet. And it starts back a long time ago. And I'm going to speed through history, but it really goes back to Oh, 450, 460 years uh, BC. And that brings us, uh, actually, I'm going to step a step just before that. I want to talk about uh, a reference that everybody seems to make to the Paleolithic time era, the Paleolithic diet, the hunter gatherer diet. Um, we all kind of make an educated guess through anthropological data of what that era was. And we, we think we can base it on uh, some. Uh, communities of people that still live that way, like the Hansa people in, uh, in Kenya. So, and maybe yes, maybe no. But the idea was that you went through times of eating and times of fasting, um, not necessarily on purpose because you ate what you killed or what their hunters went out and killed and came back, but there's also periods of time in which you had to do without. So certainly you took food with you to an extent, but fasting was um, inadvertent and it was part of your part of the evolution of us as human beings. So in that, the idea that fasting and eating what you killed was the norm to the development of our current metabolism and that going without food for periods of times, which happens to everyone, therefore, in, in that time period, therefore, the ability to survive periods of no food and not being able to eat was advantageous for survival. So your genes had to develop is the point there. Fasting is a precursor to the ketogenic diet in terms of our understanding. Uh, fasting basically will put you into ketosis. So you can say it's the same thing in many ways. Okay, but we don't understand that connection until about 1920. So that's the Paleolithic time period. I want to mention about this time period, there's a great book that came out in 2006 by Dr. Stephen Cunet, a person I know personally. Um, who does research up at Shorebrook University, he's a PhD, and he's an expert in brain chemistry. He wrote a book called The Survival of the Fattest, The Key to Human Brain Evolution. And his um, hypothesis, pretty convincing to me, especially if you read the book, is that uh, the human beings, as we know today, really didn't evolve until they could uh, have enough time in their day-to-day -to, -day to actually sit and eat, but to sit and eat primarily fatty foods. So for them to have fatty foods, it had to be, for the most part, a shoreline existence. In other words, they had fish, they had shellfish, they had, um, you might say, various seaweeds, but a vegetation that grew in that era, in that area. And so they had the fat, they had the protein, but it was all um, seafood. And quite abundant. So they had a high omega-3 diet in terms of fat as well as saturated fats. Okay, so that's a great book. I hope you get it. 
I put that in here now because it talks about evolution, Paleolithic. How do we come forward from that? Okay. All right. Now we're up to 460 years BC, basically the time of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, but we come to Hippocrates and we find that Hippocrates actually treated epilepsy with fasting. And in the history of uh, fasting and the ketogenic diet, you'll find there's certain inflection points in which a context gets shifted from what was previously thought to a new way of looking at things. And then Hippocrates was the first to shift it away from epilepsy, the falling disease, as being something that could be treated medically, medically in the sense of what they had available to them at that time. And that was fasting. He found that he actually could cure some epileptics. In other words, they fasted. And we're talking they fasted for three and four weeks. That's a long time with water, obviously. Um, and sometimes shorter. Not everybody got cured. But it seems, per documentation, that everybody did have a decrease in their seizures. And some, as I say, were cured before. On up in the Bible, there's actually a section on uh, Christ uh, treating an epileptic boy with fasting and prayer. The interesting thing about that is that uh, this father brought the epileptic boy to the disciples, the apostles, and wanted their son to be treated. And uh, the disciples, it didn't work out. The disciples couldn't do anything for him. And so then when this man uh, brought him to Jesus, to Christ, um, Christ didn't put hands on everything else. He prayed and the son fasted. And so the disciples asked him, um, Jesus, why, why, why didn't it work for us? And it worked for you. He said, well, because this particular situation needed to be fasted and prayer. Interesting that that's in the book of Mark. Okay, let's go forward. I say medical heresy helps people, but hurts a physician's practice. Really interesting story. Really interesting story. We're now in 1863, and there's a man named William Banting. His name eventually becomes put into the lexicon of the English language. But uh, he basically, in the 1860s, early 1860s, was a very successful, car very successful carpenter and an undertaker. He was the undertaker for the royalty, and uh, he and his family were doing very well. And he became very overweight, uh, obese. So he sought out a lot of medical help to help him lose weight. Now, some of the treatments actually put him back into the hospital, put him into the hospital that he needed to be treated about the treatments that he had. So he had pretty much given up, but he had uh, been referred to an ear, nose, and throat uh, physician who was a, uh, what they call a fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons. So he was pretty well-established. And his name was Dr. William Harvey. Now, um, this story is more about perfect timing than it is about any one person's knowledge and uh, putting things together. But, uh, so I hope you hear this part of the story. So Dr. William Banting had just gotten back from a conference in Paris. Now, it, was, uh, it wasn't an easy ride to get to Paris and back, but uh, he had gone to Paris, and he had listened to a man named Claude, Claude Bernard, a Dr. Claude Bernard. Now, the difference is Dr. Uh, Harvey was a physician who saw patients. Dr. Claude, Claude Barn Bernard was a research uh, physician, so he did not see patients. He basically studied the phys physiology of human beings via other animals. Here's why that's important. In his presentation that Dr. Harvey was listening to by Dr. Claude Bernard, um, Dr. Claude Bernard was presenting an entirely new idea. And this entirely new idea was that he thought, he hypothesized that the liver actually made sugar. Uh, they didn't even know, they did know it was glucose then. Yes, so that actually made glucose. He didn't know how, but he thought the, the liver, among other things, actually made sugar. And that the pancreas secreted some sort of juice that basically reduced that sugar into something else, that consumed that sugar, that disposed of that sugar. So that's what that was a big hypothesis, that you had a, 
a yin and yang relationship. You had a plus and minus. One was made by, sugar was made by one organ and it was broken down by another. Little did they know it was correct. Insulin's from the pancreas. That had yet to be discovered. So with that, with that one thought, Dr. William Harvey goes back to London where he was. And, you know, it goes back to practice and in comes William Banting asking for some help. And Dr. Harvey thought, you know, why don't we select a diet that gets rid of all the foods that we presume are sugary and starchy foods, such as the potatoes, such as the, the breads. And he actually creates a diet for William Banting that later becomes, calls the, is called the Banting diet. But um, what that diet is composed of, it's really interesting. It's a total restriction on carbohydrates, sugar and starches to make it simple, but let's get a, more, a little more specific. He could have six ounces of bacon, beef, mutton, venison, kidneys, fish, any form of poultry or game, uh, no fruit, no pastries, obviously, um, any vegetables except potatoes. And at dinner, he could have two or three glasses of good claret, sherry, or Madeira. Isn't that amazing? Banting could drink tea, but without milk or sugar. Interesting that he was excluding dairy. Uh, he could not have champagne, port, or beer. Anyway, um, Banting did this for a year. He lost about a pound a week. He always he was very pleased. He was so pleased that he was excited. He was ecstatic. He told everybody about it. He even went on to publish. Remember I said he was doing financially pretty well. He went on to publish a small book called The Letter on Corpulence Addressed to the Public. And you can actually go on Google and see what that, that document is. He published it for free for the first three editions. It went on to 60 some odd editions well after he had died. Uh, many years later, but it became so successful, and obviously I credit Dr. Harvey with making this big shift in his life, but the problem is this. This was basically against conventional medical thinking of the time. Dr. Harvey was almost um, removed of his medical, op of his, uh, medical license. He was so ostracized by the medical establishment at the time that his livelihood was certain. So he basically had a cease and desist with telling anybody about this diet. Meanwhile, the diet has become so popular, it was called the Banting diet. And if you were on the diet, and it was called that you were, banting, you were uh, to bant, you were on the Banting diet, you were banting, not bantering, you were banting. And in fact, if you go to South Africa today, and if you talk to anybody about the ketogenic diet, they'll say, oh, you're talking about the Banting diet. So that's how his, his name, uh, Banting, is one of three names that are brought into the English language. The other was uh, Captain Boycott at this, in the 1960s, 1860s as well, and Louis Pasteur for pasteurization. Isn't that amazing? So that's how popular it was. And I mention that because I'm going to be mentioning, going over, referencing that when we get 100 years from now in terms of this history. So that was his diet. It was uh, a very clear indication of let's take carbs out of the diet. It didn't focus on how much fat or how much protein. So uh, it wasn't exactly a, a zero carb idea, but it was getting pretty close. Okay, so early diabetic therapy, diabetic therapy now of the 19th centuries is starting to play with the idea of limiting carbs. And in one reference I have, I didn't find a lot of references this, that they were, they, there were some diets that were limiting to 20 carbs per day, but primarily the emphasis in this era was less about diabetes and it was more about epilepsy. Uh, and here's where the story gets very interesting. In, um, in the 1900s, for the most part, there was a man named uh, Bernard, again, uh, Bernard McFadden, and he was kind of the Jack Lane or the Charles Atlas of his day. And he was, he was a health guru and he was born of nothing. He was a, this is the, the days of vaudeville, if you will. So he's very, very much of a showman. He worked at a sanatorium or he had a sanatorium out in Battle Creek, Michigan. And he worked with the Kellogg's and the post, uh, uh people, the Kellogg brothers and the post people who were making the cereal and Kellogg cereal of, I think it's, uh, Cheerios or Wheaties, if you look on the box, it's Kellogg's. That's the same Kellogg's and Post is probably Special K or something. So it was a big sanatorium. 
and this person had a big following. He had a he had the magazine of the day called Physical Culture. But the things he believed in were certainly exercise. He was, hence that's where the Charles Atlas was actually one of his, uh, I won't say protege, but he was the mentor for Charles Atlas as well as Jacqueline. And he believed exercise, fasting, saunas, no white bread or sugar, and didn't believe in vaccines. I don't know how many vaccines were worth the day, but... All in all, he was onto something. He did a lot of crazy things as well, and he didn't believe in any medical attention. That was a bit extreme. Okay, so basically, he was treating a lot of people through fasting, and he was starting to treat a number of. He wasn't a physician, so he wasn't licensed to do this. But the the lines there were kind of vague. He started treating people with. He started treating a lot of people with fasting, arthritis, um, GI disorders, epilepsy. But he was getting the most notoriety for epileptics that had come to see him and came away either cured or uh, very much improved. So a osteopath, and osteopaths are outside of what was considered established medicine of the day. There was an osteopath by the name of Conklin who went to see what all this was about. And he ended up staying to become the assistant of um, Bernard McFadden. So he ended up being the medical connection, and he established his own relation, his own reputation on treating epilepsy. So here's where the story gets interesting. So all that's going on in the background, and by itself, if I'd stopped right there, you wouldn't have heard of either of those names. They would have just uh, disappeared. But here's what happened. There was a wealthy corporate attorney from New York City whose son was epileptic, and he sought out help, and he got no help locally in New York City. His brother, coincidentally, was the head of pediatric neurology at Johns Hopkins. And uh, his brother had nothing to offer as well, or what he had to offer uh, wasn't very successful. There was just two drugs at the time, and they just really doped up and sort of their uh, sedatives and just put children to sleep, in essence. So this corporate attorney uh, turned to a local and very uh, well-liked and in certain circles famous uh, pediatrician by the name of Garland. And so he sought out Garland's uh, advice and Garland said, you know, I personally don't have a lot of experience, uh, success with pediatric epilepsy, but there's this guy, this osteopath, Paris had thought that he's making, making this recommendation in Battle Creek, Michigan, that I will go with you to see um, how he's getting all successes. So they both went, um, this corporate attorney, the corporate attorney is, is the name of Howland. Um, and his son had to fast for three weeks. Can you imagine that? That's a fast. That's the cure fast, you know, and they, which was basically drinking water and, uh, going through various exercise classes through the day, but it was a, an amazing improvement. So he comes back, wasn't complete. He wasn't cured, but it was amazing improvement. Garland, the, the physician that accompanied Conklin to this, uh, I'm sorry, um, he accompanied Howland, who was the father of the pediatric uh, child, um, documented this whole story. And he made a local presentation to the AMA, American Medical Association, the day in the 1920s. And so um, Howland was so, was so kind of surprised that this cure or near cure came out of from the outside of the medical establishment that he started paying doctors to do research. He paid his brother to start a pediatric epilepsy center at Johns Hopkins, which is still in existence today. And he paid some Harvard um, physicians in neurology and in pedi uh, pediatrics to do research exclusively on epilepsy. And they went forward, so they took a lot of blood work, and what they found, and I'm just going to scoot through this since I pretty much know the story, and they found, you know, in the blood work of all these uh, fasting children, for the most part, that they had high ketone bodies, and it's interesting. What they thought were this was um, byproducts, unnecessary byproducts of fasting. Well, they were half right. It clearly was as a result of fasting. Uh, and to say that they're byproducts, meaning 
and byproducts means it was a waste product. It's on it's on the way to liver, and it's going to be dismissed and you know sent out with the urine or the stool. So it's nothing really to pay attention to. But you know they took the data, they wrote it down, and this the story now jumps to uh, the Midwest. I guess it's been in the Midwest for a while. Jumps to the Midwest, uh, Chicago, and uh, the Mayo Clinic that. At this time as well, in the diabetes area, there was a lot of documentation. And I noticed that diabetics got worse, that their ketones went up. So they came into what they call a ketoacidosis. You had high glucose and you had high ketones. Again, they thought these are just byproducts and what the heck is that about? So um, a, a man named Dr. Um, Wilder said, you know, well, we don't know if ketones are the thing or not the thing. What we do know is that they are elevated in the blood. So maybe we can make a diet. And they also knew at this time that uh, people that they had discovered were on high fat, low carb diets that had high ketones. So they basically then produced a more um, systematic diet. And so they were, they were wondering, can we make a diet? So the, the, the conjecture was, can we make a diet that is high in ketones? So they call it ketonemia. And, um, but Dr. Wilder said, you know, let's call it the ketogenic diet, uh, a diet that actually is made specifically with the purpose of making ketones, ketone bodies. So they did. And he turned all that work over to one of his colleagues who formulated out the diet. And what's interesting with that, so that was in 1921, the ketogenic diet was, was um, coined. But what came out of that was that the diet that was imposed at that point is pretty much the same diet that is used, it was used by Atkins and all the diets right up till now. In other words, they had it down to one gram per kilogram of body weight. They had it to uh, 15 to 10 to 15 grams of carbs and the rest fat. That's how they treated it. So pretty much that's how it is today, except that uh, we're a little more specific about the protein. They they thought, oh, just, you know, eat, eat whatever protein you want. They didn't, um, no, I'm sorry. I just told you that they had a one gram per kilogram body weight protein, 10 to 15 grams of carbs and the rest fat. It was, if, as long as you calculated the carbs and got an idea of what you needed for protein and just filled in the rest with fat in terms of what you needed on a day-to-day -day basis so they could calculate what an individual needed, call your, your basal metabolic rate, um, they were good. And that's all there was to it. They kept to that diet. And this diet went nuts, meaning it became very popular. It was very successful. It was, it was equally successful to fasting. And what they actually did is they had children that were going to start the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. They would fast for two days before they started this particular diet. Isn't it interesting? So they still coupled them together. And up until, oh, not many years ago, and they may even st still do it today, uh, of having a child fast for a day or two before they start. Um, but anyway, it became very famous up through the 30s. And then in 1936, more medications, more drugs came in for epilepsy. And this diet basically went out of vogue and almost disappeared, except for that one place that um, Attorney Holland set up for his brother um, at Johns Hopkins. And so that was the one light that stayed on through this whole era in terms of the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. So now we're going to change stations. So now that was 1921 and the diets become quite quite popular up to 1936. So in 1930s, another interesting, 1930 specifically, another interesting thing happened is um, a pretty famous Arctic explorer of the day uh, came back to uh, just be a teacher professor and he had been an Arctic explorer for the better part of uh, the previous 10 years. His name was Vilimar Stephenson, and he was a Canadian born in Canada and educated in the United States, and he was of Icelandic descent. And uh, he became an uh, anthropologist for the Arctic. And so he went up and he mapped uh, previously unknown areas. He lived with Inuits for a number of years. So when he came back, he, among all his anthropological interesting notes and the books that he wrote and uh, the language that he learned, that he came back totally certain, convinced that one a person did not need carbohydrates in their diet at all. And 
and some things are wrong. So he did not believe that anybody needed to consume any carbohydrates at all, ever. Uh, it's a pretty strong perspective to have, but he came from the perspective that, wait a minute, I've been living for the last two to six years with Inuits, and we didn't have any carbs. We just basically ate the fish, we ate the seals, we ate uh, the animals were there, and we had nothing in the way of formal, you know, plant-based carbohydrates. The Technically, the carbohydrates they did get came from eating uh, the muscle because you have glycogen in your muscles and that is a carbohydrate. But for the most part, they didn't have any plant matter or anything else in the way of carbs. So he was so certain of this that he volunteered and he had his fellow explorer uh, volunteer for an entire year to be observed and documented everything they ate 24-7. So they lived in essence a hospital in New York City. And so that, that was written up in a report and they to show that everything he had, and sure enough, he suffered no ill consequences to having no carbohydrates for an entire year. I'm floored that that, I mean, I now know this story, you know, it's no, no, no longer a novel story for me, but I find that experience being something that challenges my very thinking and my understanding of diet, for sure. One thing you can say about that particular, the Inuit diet, now I'm saying, of that era, it was a high omega-3 uh, diet, and that really kind of parallels with Dr. Quinet's book, um, Survival of the Fattest, that it was not only fat, but it was having um, the sea, the, the maritime, the, the seashore, seacoast diet of shellfish and fish. Um, interesting that. So I think omega-3s had a lot to do with it, but that's just my conjecture. Um, one thing I want to mention when people hear that about the Inuits, you know, it's like it's People are, they hear it for the first time, they're amazed that one can have a healthy diet and live so far up north and not have carbs. Um, but you can't do that today. The reason you can't do that today is because the way we've polluted the world. And one of the places in the world we've polluted a lot is the Arctic. And, uh, you know, well, how do we pollute the Arctic? And I don't mean by oil drilling or anything else, is that uh, by the wind currents, eventually all the pollution that is airborne any place in the world tends to corkscrew its way up to the Arctic uh, year after year after year. It makes it way farther north and it bio bioconcentrates. And so consequently, uh, if you go into Google or wherever you want to go for research, you'll find that the Inuit women uh, have the most toxic breast milk in the world. And the the pollutants of the day, or the pollutants that they find um, in the highest concentration are PPCs and even DDT. Um, I'm sure the DDT hopefully is getting less, but, you know, so the Inuit women have to think about, you know, well, it might not be the healthiest thing to breastfeed their children. Um, I haven't read a recent report on that, but I'm just saying that environment has changed. Okay, so now in 1958, went from 1930 to 1958, 1958 in two different parts of the world, in England and in the United States, uh, two physicians put out two books basically saying identically the same thing. Uh, the one in the United States is by a man named Pennington, and uh, he puts it in the uh, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. He calls it weight reduction, and he spells it all out. This is what one should do, and it's not a very tricky diet. Guess what? It's 20 grams or less of carbohydrates. It's... Um, it's, it's very liberal. Actually, it doesn't even measure protein and it doesn't measure fat. It, the idea is eat as much as you want as fat and protein. You know, you'll be satiated. Just measure your carbs and have under 20 carbs a day. So that was it. And um, who read this was a 28-year-old, a lot of people read this, of course, uh, was a 28-year-old cardiologist, in essence, just starting out in his practice. His name was Dr. Robert C. Atkins who then 14 years later goes on to write about the Atkins diet. And the Atkins diet, and I've actually looked at both, um, and this too, by the way, this particular weight reduction article in the JAMA, you can go online, and in this document, I highlighted it, um, and you can find exactly what that consists of. So this is exactly the Atkins diet. Um, don't mean to say anything, take any credit away from Dr. Atkins, but 
This, this is the same diet. And what I, I highlighted here, which is a little section of the, um, of the booklet, was a summary. Actually, not of the booklet. It was a summary of somebody three years later who followed up on, they called it the Pennington diet because he was the most, um, most experienced doctor in treating obese patients. And so he did a summary and uh, shows in this summary that, you know, this is basically how it all worked out. A liberal caloric high in protein, high in fat, and low in carbohydrate proposed by Pennington. That's all there was to it. That's all it took to be a specialist, and they were getting good results. Um, later, what I meant to say is that they then compare his diet to the Banting diet of 100 years before. So things really haven't changed. So in England, basically the same book, or I won't say word for word, he did his own thinking for sure. And his name is Dr. Richard McAndrus. And uh, you can go online, even find YouTubes of him being interviewed. And so how can you find YouTubes of something in the 50s as well? It's because it's a YouTube of a recording of the uh, newsreels that they used to have in the 50s, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, early 60s, um, before you went to uh, to watch a movie, you had this little newsreel. It was about him and his counseling and being interviewed. And uh, interesting. So this is from now inside the conventional medicine medical tent, but uh, it's kind of still marginalized. And on uh, Dr. McCandress's, uh booklet, he talks about on alcohol consumption. I thought this was interesting. And he directly references the other man in the U in the United States and saying, well, you know, alcohol might not be that bad. I left the quote here. I'm not going to read to it, but he talks about alcohol, but he also talks again, a direct reference to the Banting evidence. So that's how important the Banting diet was. Remember I mentioned he paid for his first, the first three editions. They went through 60 some odd editions after that. That's very impressive. So now you think that everything's sort of being the same history is being redone and people are catching on to the, uh, basically what you need to to eat to be healthy and not be overweight. Well, actually, that's not true. What happens now is in 1961, man of the year for Time Magazine, right here is a man named Ansel Keys. And Ansel Keys uh, basically fabricates a study, and nobody knows it's fabricated until 2016. Um, and what that was is that, no, 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 heart disease is caused by high consumption of saturated fats and if you have high, which drives high cholesterol if you have high cholesterol you will have uh, a high probability of heart disease of stroke of cardiovascular uh, diseases of whatever that may be and so that was it he did a, uh, a country or culture by culture uh, scale of how much uh, fat was in that cultural diet and where the rates of heart disease were the thing was he left out a lot of countries so he uh, made that uh, scale fit his conclusion. Anyway, so that was Ansel Keys, 1961. This is what all of dietary recommendations were based on for the next 60 years. And not only that, this is what the pharmaceuticals uh, based their whole satin reason, uh, satin, statin reasons. So your Lipitors and Crestors, etc. This is all directly about this. And this becomes, as you say, the dominant view of diet for the next 60 years and foundation of the incredibly profitable market of statins. It gets refuted in 1916 by a book um, called The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholz. And I'm gonna end part one right here.